Hello, everyone, and welcome to NACTO's public webinar on fire trucks and Vision Zero. My name is Kate Villanier. I'm the strategy director here at NACTO, and I'm going to be your moderator today. So for those of you who are new to NACTO, we are the National Association of City Transportation Officials. We're a coalition of over 60 transportation departments and transit agencies across North America. And our goal is to help cities share information and best practices that can help make better places for people with safe and sustainable and accessible and equitable transportation choices that support a strong economy and a vibrant quality of life. Webinars like this one are key to NACTO's mission, bringing together city transportation department operators, advocates, and other interested parties to learn from each other, help cities develop city-focused design standards that meet urban needs, and help provide a platform for leading and new voices in transportation. So we're really excited to have you all with us here today. Some quick logistics before we get started. We're gonna leave about 20 minutes at the end of the presentations for Q&A, but you can begin sending in or typing in your questions as they come up. Which brings me to the second point, which is asking questions. On your on-screen control panel, there is a question box. You can use this to type in your questions and do that as you think of them, as they come to you. Uh, and we'll try to get through as many of them as possible at the end. If you think of a question after the moment's passed, go ahead and type it in anyway, and we'll try to get that answered for you as well. Um, yes, we will be releasing the recording and slides from this webinar on our website in the next couple of days. And yes, this webinar is available for one AICP CM credit. Uh, feel free to log your hours once the webinar wraps up. Uh, and just so you all know, NACTO hosts webinars like this relatively frequently. So please feel free to continue checking our website which is www.nacto.org. So with that, the topic today is the relationship between fire prevention and traffic fatality prevention, and how changes to how we prevent and fight fires can also help reduce traffic fatalities. We're gonna talk about the role livable, walkable street design plays in fire prevention, and we'll take a closer look at fire truck designs that are currently available on the market that can make fire trucks smaller and safer while maintaining and in some places improving their firefighting capacity. We're gonna start with a moment of history. The story of firefighting in the United States is largely a success story. In the 1970s, about 7,000 Americans died annually in fires. Since then, fire departments have employed a systems focused approach. For example, using fire codes to ban certain materials or require types and numbers of exits. And have, and have steadily reduced that number by about half. In contrast, with the exception of declines during economic recessions, traffic fatalities have remained consistently high since the 1960s. In 2017, over 40,000 people in the United States died in a traffic crash. In recent years, many U.S. cities have adopted a systems-focused approach to reducing traffic deaths, broadly known as Vision Zero. Traffic planners and engineers in those cities have worked to redesign streets to slow speeds, narrow lanes, reduce crossing distances, and provide space for bicyclists and pedestrians as well as drivers. In the places that have done this well, New York, for example, traffic deaths have fallen to their lowest number since 2010. But as the system's knowledge in each individual discipline, firefighting and transportation, has grown, cross-discipline conversations have not always kept pace. Many commonly used American fire trucks require street widths and intersection designs that encourage speeding and create unsafe streets. Transportation departments and fire departments, core agencies that are both charged with public safety, often get pitted against one another in public fights around the allocation of street space. So today we have with us three experts to talk about how to bridge these divides and what opportunities they see for saving lives. From Portland, Oregon, we have Fire Chief Mike Myers, and from the US DOT Volpe Center, two leading engineers and analysts, Alec, Alex Epstein and Jonah Chirenza. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to our panelists. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Chief Myers. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's this uh, morning here on the West Coast in uh, Portland still. So I know it's uh, afternoon for some of you. Um, thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, uh, in my office, uh, and, and for questions later, I actually have uh, Deputy Chief of Special Operations for Portland Fire, uh, Don Russ, with me, and uh, Bicycle Coordinator from Portland Bureau of Transportation, who we work with uh, very closely, Roger Geller, with me as well. So I, uh, if there are opportunities for questions later, uh, I may uh, ask them to step in and, uh, and help. Um, 
We have uh, about 20 minutes, so I'm going to um, kind of move through a, a um, presentation with you that move that over that uh, largely hinges on not just a fire truck or what I call fire apparatus design, engine companies and, and, and fire uh, truck company design, but really I wanna to talk to you about the, what the mission of the fire service typically has been and where I believe the mission of the fire service can go in the future. Um, and I, I, I'm hopeful to kind of share some of these details with you. Our, our mission here at Portland Fire and Rescue uh, is, is to aggressively protect lives, property, and the environment. Um, I come here with a personal mission for Portland, and this is going to be important as we talk through the rest of the slides, uh, that my personal mission as a fire chief is to assure the health and welfare of all of the community members in Portland. And um, I know there's a small difference there, but uh, it's going to be very important as we uh, talk through uh, the presentation today. It's interesting, um, you know, uh, come at a, uh, obviously all of us on the, uh, the line today have a, a been in an interesting time in the United States. Uh, we've watched the disruption of, of businesses that I, I never thought would be disrupted. I never thought retail sales would be disrupted and we would have Amazon. I never thought the landline phone would be disrupted. The, the taxi cab authority would be disrupted. And it's, it's a, a, always been a very refreshing thing to watch as we've seen progress. And there's no reason to think why the fire service itself can't, it isn't right for disruption as well. When I sit through budget hearings, and I imagine there's a lot of city planners on, on the phone, I would assume there are city administrators on the phone. Um, as, as a municipal official, when I sit through budget sessions, I hear a common theme. And that is, and I know this for a fact, because I just see it in my own budget, that our budgets for the Fire Bureau are simply unsustainable into the future. And I cannot continue to do business, business the same way I've done it in the past, the same way I'm currently doing it in the future, and think that I'm possibly going to be able to, to sustain the, the cost going forward. And the city itself, including Portland, is in the same situation. Doing business the way we've done in the past simply is unsustainable in the future, so something has to change. If you would have asked me 100 to 200 years ago you know, what I thought were the uh, leading causes uh, of, of public health issues, what my greatest challenges were. And, and uh, in, back in the 1800s, I would have told you as a fire chief, our greatest problem are these great fires that every city's having. And it's all the cities are on fire. And that is the largest public health threat. We are burning down large swaths of our city. It's causing great disruption to our commercial uh, business. They're, they're closing down, they're moving out. It's causing mass refugees. We, we lose a large swaths of housing. Um, and today, that's not the problem. As a fire service, we tackled that back in the late 1800s, and today, that problem has largely been solved. Outside of wildland fires, we've solved that problem. But we, as a fire serv service, did not do it alone. We brought forward the idea and the theory that we could fix it, but with us as partners, we're always city planners, street designers, uh, developers, people that wrote policy, people that wrote code. The fire service never did not do this alone. We had great partners along the way. So my argument today is largely going to be that cities are still on fire. It's not the red stuff that's burning cities down today. The, 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 we, we're not burning down neighborhoods. It's not city blocks. It's it's one single structure, and we have a performance goal to keep the fire to the room of origin 90% of the time. It's not those things. The things that are leading to disruption in commercial property and, and businesses leaving and, and large portions of our population move out, moving out due to gentrification or poverty, it is, it is these things. Uh, homelessness, congestion, income inequality, or it, these types of things that are leading to what I call cities that are still on fire today. So it's a proposition that I personally made within the fire service that I believe the fire service has a responsibility to lead us out of this fire as well. And what that means to us is that we have to do something different. We spend a tremendous amount of money in the fire service building a reactive base to running all the calls that we run that come in through 911. Right, it's 30 here in Portland. It's 31 fire stations, a host of fire trucks and apparatus, and and, and about 700 firefighters. 
And then I spent a tremendous amount of time and energy and money on prevention efforts around you know, smoking, cooking, and, and the uh, careless use of fire-related materials. And, and a lot of money in the city is spent on these things on the screen. And just in, in homelessness here in Portland, we spend tens of millions of dollars a year on these types of things. The commonly associated perceived risk, if, if you like, looked at what, what's causing fire out there, um, it's, it's these things, mental health, poor housekeeping, alcohol, smoking, and drugs. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, chief, those look very common. Um, those perceived risk factors look not just for fire deaths, but aren't those for every public health issue in the community? And the answer would be yes. If, if I lead a heat map over the city of Portland and I said, where are the fires occurring and where are the next fires likely to occur? Where are my fire deaths occurring? And I laid a heat map over the city of Portland and says, where is poverty? Or, or I laid a heat map over the uh, city of Portland and I said, where are my low graduation rates? Those heat maps would look almost identical. Right? It's all the same thing. They're all, all these same risk factors are all related. So when I, I look at fire and I know I have a reactive response force here and I'm putting all my money into putting smoke detectors in and and funding uh, homelessness and funding uh, 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 housing. And then I, and I, I start to wonder what's causing all of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, like alcohol and, and, and drug related offenses, what's actually causing all of that? And it's the, these are the actual risk factors that a fire chief or a public official should be focusing on. It's poor walkability, a lack of access to health care, lack of safe walkable streets, lack of, lack of access to healthy to, to parks, um, um, lack of access to, to, to healthy foods. These are the things that are driving all of the public health issues and driving all of the fires. Well, so as a fire chief, this is where I should putting all, be put, putting all of my attention, all of my focus, and a, and a large amount of, of my dollars. There's a story in public health that I love to share, and it kind of goes like this. There's a, there's a small village near a, near a lake that has a waterfall coming into it, and the villagers you know, enjoy being around the lake, and one day they see a child drowning in the lake, and they call for the rescuers. Come, come help us get this child out of this lake. There's the child drowning, and the rescuers rush to the child, and they pull the child out of the lake, and as they're doing so, another child comes over the waterfall into the lake and is drowning. And the rescuers get that child out. And they keep looking up and more children are coming over the waterfall into the lake. And pretty soon they're saying, Let's get more rescuers, call for more rescuers. We have more children, more rescuers, and more rescuers come. And that continues as we as, as the more children are falling to the lake, more rescuers are more rescuers are coming. Then at one point someone looks up and one of the rescuers are leaving. It's, they're, they're running away from the scene and Somebody calls in and says, where are you going? We need everybody here to help us. Where are you running off to? And the rescuer turns around and says, I'm going up above the waterfall to find out why the children are getting in the water, uh, the water to begin with. And that's where I, as public official, need to shift my mentality, not to the, from reactive and rescuing constantly, but shift to above the waterfall and find out why these things are occurring. So in Portland, we are actually, our opinion from the fire service is that vibrant cities don't burn. And we actually have hired an individual from Harvard's uh, uh, Pub, uh, Chan Public Health School of Public Health to help us actually prove that, that vibrant cities don't burn. That if we change the vibrancy of an area of the city, that that area will not have a high likelihood for a shooting, will not have a high likelihood of a pedestrian accident, will not highly have a, a likely have, have a, a fire. And that is our goal, and that's where we're putting our money and our attention. So if you look at, just gonna, this is a pretty basic slide, and I actually thought about taking it out, but I thought I'll just leave it in, because the fact is, if you're on the, on the bad side of this equation, we have poor walkability, we have people that are incarcerated, people that don't have jobs, people that uh, are living in poverty, people that don't have health insurance. That is very costly on social services. That is a huge negative impact on your city and very, very expensive. As a public official, and I happen to be the fire chief, my job should be to do whatever I have to do to work with other city 
bureaus, other county uh, uh, assets, uh, the nonprofits to get people out of the bad side of the column into the good side of the column. Because we know if people own a home or are renting that have a job, that are that have a car or have a means to get around or are, are using mass transit or that they're functioning and having a happy, healthy life, a more vibrant life. And that is my goal. So one of the questions that I was asked was, um, uh, what, what's in it for, for a fire chief for to have a, a vibrant city? And, and so I, I wanted to comment on a couple things that we're doing here in Portland. So when we look at a city block, and, and we're looking at an area that has high impact that is, uh, is in the bad side of the equation, and there is a drive to do pedestrian enhancements and street enhancements and some urban renewal. But why does that help a fire chief other than the things I've just told you? Uh, we actually sit down block by block with street planners and the fire bureau and design the street out together. Because a, 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 a pedestrian enhanced street that's beautified, that has good business access, that has good walkability, all favors what I've been talking about. And all I need as a fire bureau is to get what apparatus that I have through it. So we work block by block. It's given me an opportunity. In fact, we've done that in Portland for quite some time. And I will state this openly so everybody can hear it. We have not, and we've been doing this for a while, we have not had any reduction in response times. Let me state it again. There has been no reduction in response times by working with transportation leaders and urban planners to build out Portland. It's given me a chance as a fire chief because I have these discussions with city planners to have further discussions on why do I have multiple engine companies at a fire scene? Why do I bring in one fire truck from the south and one fire truck from the north so they both meet at a home and we need streets connected? So now they're, they understand me more and understand what the fire service does more and they help me get things done. So they're actually bring me to the table when we start to have discussions about what a smart city looks like. Because in the future, a smart city for me as a fire chief is going to lend a ton of, of enhancements and efficiencies to the fire service. When you're laying street and you're putting in large bandwidth fiber, I benefit from that. Traffic preemption tomorrow, is all done wirelessly through a smart fire truck that communicates with the smart traffic signal, it changes the green lights and gets us to where we need to go. It allows me to do mobile patient care reporting. So in the street, my firefighters can do all their patient care reporting on a tablet in the street and upload it wirelessly. It gives me a venue to talk about uh, residential sprinklers, when we, and which is a huge issue for fire chiefs, while we're talking about urban renewal. Pedestrian enhancements, lowers traffic fatalities, lowers pedestrian fatality. That should be a primary goal of public officials. It can go on and on and on. If we're talking about eliminating food deserts, it helps me with obesity and it helps me with people that have bad choices and food choices, which also, for those of you, those of you that don't know, the fire service, about 20% of our calls are probably fire and rescue work. The other 80% is medical. We run cardiac arrests, strokes, gunshots to the head, ejections from a rollover, falls greater than 20 feet, that's the bulk of our work. Ultimately, the fire service has to figure out a new way to deploy its apparatus, a different way that we do the operation. And we've got to disrupt the size and the configuration of the fire apparatus. That has to happen, and we can only do that if the vendors come with us. And I, you'll probably hear a little bit later today some uh, creative ideas on what they do on the other side of the planet. They seem to be doing just fine on putting fires out. So this is a little snapshot of Portland. Um, we're not too bad. I would argue they've been, we've been working with our street planners and our urban planners for quite some time. Our big focus is on livability. We're all in. As a fire service, that's what we want. So we're, we want to be at the table actually driving livability, driving uh, vibrancy of the city. And by these numbers, I don't think we look too bad. Portland is not broken. So anybody that's crying to you that if, we, if, you, if, the, if the fire service gets engaged and starts making changes, the whole city will implode, simply not true. This is a simple uh, map of Portland, a little bit hard to read, but you'll see a heat map there that shows our fires in 2017. Um, we uh, have a, a gentleman, the same gentleman, Harvard, that we work with here in Portland, 
has basically, this is, and this is a discussion about changing the way we, we do business. We are able today to predict right down to the tax ID number where we think our next fire is going to occur to almost the 70, 70 percentile. That same prediction model, we can almost predict where the next shooting is going to occur. And we could almost predict down to the 70 percentile where we believe the next pedestrian is going to get hit. And when we look at not only the formula of where we think those things are going to happen, and then we take Google Earth and actually either drive out to this location or look at it, it is always a socially and economically depressed area that could use vibrancy and urban renewal. So the focus should be, if my intent is to reduce traffic accidents, reduce pedestrians getting hit, reduce shootings, reduce fires, my focus as a fire chief must be on focusing on livability and must be focusing on a vibrancy of a city, which comes with pedestrian enhancements, street enhancements, urban renewal, live, uh, walkable, safe walkable streets. That's where our focus needs to be. So we actually, uh, you know, these, uh, this is where our fatal crashes have occurred. Uh, these are where our homicides have occurred. We actually take, uh, in each one of these numbers are fire stations, by the way, there are 31 of them. So we actually take each one of these out. And let's just take uh, uh, station 11 here and take it, it's bottom uh, middle, uh, you'll see the number 11. We're gonna take that one out and just look at it closer. We build blueprints for success for these, each one of these run areas uh, and, and work with the company officer to bring in outside departments and bureaus and county assistants and nonprofits. We focus right on that red spot, whatever that is, whether that's fires, whether it's fatal crashes, and we build a blueprint for success to attack that area by whatever ever means necessary. If we can change that red spot from red to yellow to blue by cooperating with multiple bureaus I'm doing my job as a fire chief, ultimately, in, in, in making sure the call doesn't happen in the first place. We have a very simple campaign here. This is, I just took some snapshots of, of what our initiative is. Uh, this is Nil, our, he's our, uh, he or she is our zero. Zero is our hero. Our intent is to get to zero fire deaths here in Portland. Never been done before. Um, I believe it can be done through good modeling and good predictability. If we can change the way we predict uh, uh, where fires and, and problems are going to occur, I can figure out a new way to deploy. And I believe we can get to zero traffic fatalities and it's really about not neglecting any neighborhood in our, in our city, focusing right uh, down on those, those red spots where they happen in neighborhoods. So uh, I wanted to kind of summarize uh, uh, some comments that we had today. Um, you know, it, 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 we, the, the tradition of the fire service has been the, the population increases. That means we're going to have more calls within a city. The, the types of emergency calls that go through the 911, the fire service has historically said, just send them to the fire service. We'll run, uh, we'll, we'll run all those calls. We'll send apparatus out on everything. Um, if we continue to do that long term, that is an unsustainable format and a, a, a unsustainable uh, a plan to, to, to keep running the fire bureau. So it's our interest to get out and get in front of it and uh, start eliminating those calls coming into 911. And we believe, believe that is uh, by, by working with other bureaus and establishing uh, vibrancy within the city. So um, that's my part of the presentation today. And I wanted to thank you for having me here. Um, my next step is to uh, hand it off to uh, Alex and Jonah with the Volpe Center. Great, thank you very much um, for a really inspiring and hard to follow presentation, but uh, we will do our best. Uh, my name is Jonah Kirenza, um, joining Alex Epstein from the Volpe Center. Um, the Volpe Center is a, a um, part of the US Department of Transportation uh, located here in Cambridge. Um, we have about um, 570 federal staff and 400 on-site contractors. Um, all uh, engaged in our mission, which is to advance transportation innovation for the public good. Um, we provide services to other parts of the federal government, 
um, including DOT and our partners at Federal Highway and Federal Transit Administration, as well as other modes, um, in addition to other agencies like um, Department of the Interior. Um, we aim to objectively address our most pressing and complex transportation challenges. And today we're going to talk to you about why we're looking at vehicle design in partnership with NACTO. Um, our goal is to identify innovative approaches to vehicle design to help decrease emergency vehicle response time and access limitations, um, to increase municipal fleet and contracted large vehicle capabilities and ultimately private vehicle capabilities, uh, improve roadway safety, and also expand design flexibility for roadway, streetscape, and public space uh, design and implementation. So Jonah, can we hop in for one second? You're on a funny um, view. If you can switch to regular presentation mode, we're seeing your next slide as well. Oh, you're getting the preview. How's that? Perfect. Great. Thank you. So why are we talking about downsizing? Um, the reason we're talking about downsizing of vehicles, making vehicles smaller and more maneuverable, um, particularly focused on fire, but then, as I mentioned, expanding to potentially other municipal and private vehicles, um, is that we can achieve um, street design improvements, um, as the chief was explaining, that will result in slower speeds, increased visibility and reaction time, decreased crossing distances and times um, to achieve the potential safety benefits um, that are associated with those improvements. So as I advance through these slides, you'll see this diagram showing um, a view of something I'm sure we've all seen in various formats um, before. This is actually from ProPublica, um, that the uh, decrease in speed is associated strongly with a decrease in uh, mortality when um, in vehicle collisions. So what is downsizing? And I think for some of the folks on the call, this is going to be um, a, a review of something you know well, and for others, it may be uh, new information. Um, so I'll go quickly through it um, so we can get to Alex's portion of the presentation. But uh, a design vehicle is a term that transportation engineers, transportation planners use. Um, it defines the parameters for sort of minimum access uh, for a street. So on a particular street, or set of streets or a portion of your street network, you'd have a certain design vehicle that you want to make sure the street is um, accommodating without that vehicle sort of violating the envelope that you want it to be operating in. And so you can see here, this is a WB40, which is a standard sort of 18 wheeler tractor trailer. And for it to make this turn, you see that shaded portion is the swept path of the vehicle, body and wheels. And um, it, it takes quite a bit of space to allow that vehicle to make its turn without crossing into an additional lane. Um, maintaining that vehicle's um, sort of status as the design vehicle on a street would allow you to make bulb outs in this sort of hypothetical example, but relatively small bulb outs. And so to show you sort of the extreme alternative, if we go with a much smaller design vehicle and we design the street so that uh, it works for say a passenger car, or in the case that's more realistic, a more maneuverable um, large delivery vehicle or fire apparatus, we can then drastically change that intersection to accommodate um, much shorter crossings, much larger areas for placemaking and pedestrian uh, amenities, um, and all the things that happen at the sort of interstitial space um, along the curb, bike lanes, uh, landscaping, stormwater infiltration, uh, as, and, and also, um, you could have sort of ancillary traffic benefits by shorting crossing distances. You can tighten up signal timing, and so you can actually get traffic improvements out of this type of design. Uh, so it's, it's really multimodal improvements. Um, and then you can use other tools such as uh, enforcement, paint, um, signal timing to still accommodate uh, those large vehicles as necessary. Um, which are not being retrofitted um, to, to operate as smaller design vehicles. So again, just to drive this point home, the benefits of smaller vehicles, um, changing the wheelbase, the wheel cut, steering axle configuration width and driver's seat height, this all results in things that we can change in the street environment um, to achieve those other broader goals of livability and access, um, active transportation, uh, and vitality that um, the chief was mentioning. 
uh, reducing turn radii, um, street width, and eliminating blind spots. Again, just um, taking uh, another look at our sort of bullets from the first slide, decreasing um, response times and access limitations so that we sh are sure our apparatuses um, and emergency response vehicles. And then again, ancillary benefits, um, delivery uh, and other freight vehicles can get to the places they need to get to efficiently, um, increasing that, cap that capability so that vehicles are able to operate in these, in these new and different environments in more efficient ways, improving roadway safety, um, and really expanding design flexibility so that we give our um, city planners and others in um, city and municipal government the tools and flexibility they need to really achieve that livability um, through street design. I'll turn it over to Alex. This is Alex. Uh, I'm an engineering systems analyst here at the Volpe Center, and uh, we've been working with NACTO on um, <clears throat> a variety of vehicle safety design and technology studies, um, and we're pleased to share some insight on this million-dollar question. Can a smaller vehicle still do the job? Because if it can't, then we have to revisit the entire um, premise on which this, this talk is based. Let's take a look first at the non-emergency vehicles. Our research with the manufacturers and fleets has provided some insight into whether smaller necessarily means less capable. And what we have found is that presuming that a smaller platform, uh, say for a cargo truck or a box truck in this case, uh, does not necessarily need to be assumed to be less capable. And capability can be measured, for example, through how much cargo it can carry its gross vehicle weight rating, uh, or it can be measured by the volume, the maximum cargo body length, uh, assuming a relatively standard width. And if we look at this situation here, we compare, in this case, we have three domestic and one international model um, that we've compared as much apples to apples as possible. You can see, for example, the three axle truck there with a 52,000 pound gross vehicle weight rating um, that's a very standard Kenworth vehicle with a tandem axle in the back uh, that you would expect to see in an urban delivery environment for heavier loads. Uh, that would have a curb-to-curb -curb turn radius of 40 feet. That means that for that vehicle to be able to execute a perfect U-turn, it would need 40 feet of clear width, which is not commonly found on especially older city streets. Uh, it also has implications for left turns and, and, and right turns and other maneuvers, as, uh, as Jonah alluded to earlier. Uh, and it would have a maximum cargo body length of 30 feet on that particular chassis. Um, now, if you take a look at a European vehicle, this is a, a Mercedes uh, chassis, uh, which would be a Freightliner equivalent in the U.S. Uh, you would have a same gross vehicle weight rating. However, you would have only a 33-foot curb radius because that rear axle is steerable, so you have effectively a more maneuverable vehicle. Uh, but yes, there would be potentially a trade-off on the length. So let's take a look at the two-axle. And again, pay, pay, mostly, uh, pay attention mostly to the relative differences between these numbers. If you have a, a two-axle box truck, and again, we're, here we're comparing truly a Kenworth to a Kenworth, so even the same manufacturer. Uh, just by selecting the cab over vehicle on the right, one can maintain the same cargo capacity, this, uh, actually have a longer cargo body so you can carry more goods, and have approximately a one-third smaller turn radius, significantly more maneuverable for an urban environment. And the reason we, we have looked at box trucks here is that they are a useful proxy for a variety of cargo carrying vehicles, not just general freight, but also uh, dump trucks and garbage bodies um, and flatbeds and racks and many others. Underscoring what I just said, one can have the same gross vehicle weight rating but a smaller turn radius or both the same gross vehicle weight rating and a larger cargo body with a smaller turn radius. Now we turn our attention to emergency vehicles. And this is where we, we hope to provide some uh, some tools to um, uh, follow the toolkit that uh, Chief Myers described uh, in, in the earlier part of the talk. Um, looking at uh, the two types of, of fire apparatus, pumpers and ladders, we, we first take a look at pumpers. 
And here we have three examples of, of US uh, fire pumper trucks or engines. Uh, we have a standard, uh, relatively standard model on the left, taken from Amherst, Massachusetts, where we have a carrying capacity uh, of 750 gallons. And I'll highlight here, again, comparing really just these performance metrics. Um, what a fire pumper needs to do is it needs to bring water and it needs to pump water at the scene of a fire. So looking across here, we see that a small compromise was made by the San Francisco Fire Department when they spec specified a smaller platform. They went from 750 to 500 gallons of carrying capacity, but they maintained fire pumping capacity in gallons per minute. But one need not stop there. There are even smaller pumper um, uh, platforms available like this rapid attack apparatus that has a, uh, a, an impressively short wheelbase uh, which results in a curb-to-curb -curb turn radius of only 19 feet compared to 25 in San Francisco compared to 36 in a relatively standard uh, wheelbase uh, pumper that you might find in most American fire departments. However, uh, pumpers are significantly smaller vehicles in general than aerial apparatus or ladder trucks, uh, the truck company side of, of any uh, fire department. Uh, so there we go, same pumping capacity, smaller turning radius, so where we looked next was representative aerial apparatus. And these are um, uh, reported to be the three largest fire service, urban fire services in the world, Tokyo, Paris, and New York City. Um, you can see that the fire apparatus has developed uh, rather differently in these different parts of the world. And when we compare um, representative uh, US apparatus and German apparatus um, and their capabilities, um, we take a look first, for example, at a very common type of vehicle, uh, the ladder truck. Uh, and we have here, uh, as our representative example, the Seagrave aerial scope, which is particularly common in, in New York and other, uh, other parts of the, the eastern part of the country. Um, we have the performance metrics for a ladder truck. What do the ladder trucks uh, need to do to do its job? It needs to reach relatively high and relatively far across. So that's called the ladder height and the ladder reach. Um, and it needs to be able to access it by getting there on any streets that, uh, that are necessary to, to access the fire. So um, accessibility is improved when the turn radius is, is made smaller. Uh, so here we have an example. We have virtually identical ladder reach, actually slightly improved ladder height, and approximately half the turn radius for that German uh, Majerus M32 uh, vehicle on the right, which, which has all steer uh, axles. Uh, if you can't quite make it out, that rear axle, the drive axle, is also steering. Uh, so significantly smaller turn radius. And for um, tiller apparatus, uh, aerial ladders that are tractor-drawn aerials, or TDAs, uh, here we have a similar example. There really are no tillered apparatus outside North America as far as we were able to find. Um, but uh, the nearest comparison would be a tandem axle on the right, that Madras M60L. And that it's actually possible to find a German apparatus that goes up to 68 meters, or about 230 feet. Um, so more than twice as high as the, the highest US uh, ladder trucks can go. Um, and this is a comparison here. So again, about 100 feet versus 200 feet on the German model. Uh, uh, a little bit of a compromise on the ladder reach. Um, and actually a, uh, a larger turn radius, although that is because of the tiller's ability to rear steer. Um, so what we're demonstrating here is the performance metrics can be maintained at roughly um, half or a little more than half of the, of the turn radius for a ladder truck. For a tiller truck, uh, potentially you can, you can get significantly higher uh, ladder height um, <coughs> on a smaller platform. And that's where if you look at the bottom, you can see the overall length is significantly smaller for that, that uh, vehicle in the rightmost column. To put it into perspective, and this is our next to last slide, the uh, performance envelope of these vehicles, when we looked into the specifications and compared them side by side, uh, tell the story fairly well. Uh, effectively, the, the ladder trucks, um, uh, the two the two on the left, those, uh, the American ladder truck and the German one, uh, the Seagrave and the Madras, have identical reaches uh, 
virtually identical, slightly higher actually on the German. Uh, it's hard to tell with the scale here, but going over 30 meters or about 100 feet height, uh, but again, uh, half the turn radius on the, on the German model. And then uh, double the height for the latter on the, on the Madras uh, compared to the um, uh, typical uh, tractor-drawn aerial or tiller, uh, which, is, which is a fairly iconic uh, vehicle in, in many fire departments. To wrap up what we've just discussed, uh, our initial research here at Volpe uh, indicates that downsized uh, emergency and non-emergency vehicles can potentially maintain or increase their capability, uh, not necessarily uh, assuming that uh, there are trade-offs. Uh, there may be trade-offs, but if one selects for key performance metrics and selects um, wisely the makes and models uh, along those performance metrics, it is possible to get a win-win for a downsized and more capable vehicle. Um, in terms of what that means, um, thinking back to the toolkit that Chief Myers described, um, we're looking at potentially decreased emergency vehicle response time and access limitations throughout a city's streets, um, increasing the capabilities of city and city contracted and ultimately private vehicle fleets, uh, improved roadway safety, um, expanded design flexibility for how the road is designed tomorrow for human, human scale streets and shorter pedestrian crossings and, and multimodal uh, vibrancy. Um, and uh, not listed here, but also uh, a co-benefit as uh, reduced wear and tear on the infrastructure. Um, Federal Highway, uh, I might mention, there, there are some um, uh, changes in, in the regulations uh, in progress to uh, exempt uh, fire apparatus from uh, from axle weight limits that apply to other trucks, um, reflecting how the size of apparatus has grown over the decades, um, there is an opportunity to um, preserve the infrastructure, uh, be able to design future streetscapes um, for a more vibrant urban environment, and also preserve or maintain uh, or even increase the capability of the large vehicles on the streets. Uh, so I'll wrap it there and uh, hand it back to, um, to Kate and Sasha. Fantastic, and thank you so much to all three of you for those excellent presentations. Uh, we're going to go now into some questions. There are instructions on your screen um, for how to ask them, but again, just type them into that, that question box, and we've got a bunch already, so we're going to get started. Um, the first one, and I think it's partially for, for you, Chief Myers, and also partially perhaps for some of your guests in the room, um, and it's really around the question of how Portland has gone about setting emergency access route standards, or, or sort of are all the streets in Portland considered the same when it comes to emergency access, or um, how did Portland Fire and Portland Bureau of Transportation work together in terms of thinking about things like street width or the standards for street width in ways that streets could accommodate emergency access and bicycles and pedestrians and traffic fatality reduction measures? Yeah, this is uh, Deputy Chief Don Russ. Um, I work closely with uh, Roger Geller, who's in the, uh, the webinar with us, uh, with Portland Department of Transportation and some of the engineers. Um, what's really made my job easier in when a lot of the design proposals I cross my desk is we've got a, a solid emergency response classification that's uh, adopted into the uh, transportation system plan. And so we have major emergency routes that are classified that are that are dedicated for emergency routes, um, transportation uh, respects those uh, when they send designs, and we don't make a lot of alterations to them. Um, and but we recently created a secondary emergency response classification, and of course the third is the local access roads, the smaller streets, which we don't use much. But coupled with these three classifications, um, it allowed us to, you know, uh, put. Uh, put tra traffic calming devices, such as speed cushions, and then the trade-off was we they're starting to slowly start eliminating the speed tables, the old speed bumps, as you will, off of our major emergency routes. So that's, I think, a big factor of why our response times have not suffered with, with the development and the redesign of our, um, of our roads and to incorporate some of the active um, um, access through biking and pedestrian routes. Yeah, and I guess I'll, this is Roger Geller, and I guess I'll just add that, uh, you know, this is the result of almost two decades of working together with Fire Bureau Transportation to figure out these issues. We are not building a lot of new roadways in the city of Portland. Uh, our roadways tend to be small, so we're working with what we've already got on the street. 
and we have a very good understanding about what is allowed on primary emergency response routes, what's allowed on secondary emergency response routes, and so we work very cooperatively. And you know, so far we found that we are able to uh, incorporate really almost all the designs that we're interested in having for protected bike lanes and other types of bike facilities on streets, uh, as long as we work uh, carefully with the police bureau. Uh, sorry, with the fire bureau. Great, thank you. Um, a sort of second kind of follow-up question to that um, that's been coming across is what, and this is for, for everybody, um, what has the conversation been with some of the, the big vehicle, the fire truck manufacturers out there? You know, I think there's, you've all sort of made the case that there are smaller vehicles that are possible and that fire departments can rethink some, some processes and ways to make that work. But what's the conversation with manufacturers and as cities, um, particularly some of the folks on, on the line here who, you know, are policymakers for those cities, uh, go into conversations with fire truck manufacturers, what do they need to be asking for? I can, uh, this is Chief Myers from Portland. I'll just kind of start and uh, hopefully, I, I don't know if the vehicle manufacturers are on the webinar or not, but uh, I'll, be, I'll be cautious. So we, um, you know, we've had very frank discussion with vendors uh, of our fire trucks. We, we are a, pretty much a sole source uh, uh, with, with Portland. We, we hire, we, we uh, do work with one vendor. But um, so I've had just very frank discussion with them about what we need to do here to change. I can have all of the ideas that I want uh, and where we want to go, but without a cooperative vendor to help me get there, I will never achieve my goals. And um, so I need vendors that are going to come with me, that are interested in what we are interested in, that see the benefit. But um, you know, in, when I talk to, the, to them, the, the conversation ends and is there a market for a smaller fire truck? And they look at me and, and they shake their head and no. There are still cities out there municipal cities that are, that are actually requesting bigger fire trucks than we have today. So uh, now that's not to say that after, you know, not heated discussion, but very serious discussion with, with you know, who I spend millions of dollars with, uh, that the, at least the group that we are with have um, went back, talked to their engineers and have invited me back out. I will go sit and talk and we, they are going to help us look at what they could produce. Um, but until there's a market, until there is a, a, a little bit of momentum of a smaller fire truck uh, where there's a market for these vendors to actually shift and start making something, um, I'm not 100% sure the American market will, will shift. Uh, but, but we are, they do understand the seriousness of it. Um, I've you know, been as serious as I can be without being you know, arrogant or rude. Um, that we need change, and so they're starting to listen and, and uh, um, starting to have discussions with those engineers. Great, thank you. Um, a question for, for both the Volpe folks and, and the Portland folks. Um, there's a lot of curiosity about sources and references, and we're actually just curious, folks are curious if you can talk a little bit more about some of the, the data behind the work that you have uh, for Portland. I think that's really a question around the, the Harvard study and whether or not some of that is gonna be made public. For the Volpe folks, I think those questions are really coming in in terms of what are the, the next steps that you see out of the research you're doing? What are people gonna be able to have access to to bring back to their own cities um, and show to their respective policymakers, uh, fire departments, mayors, et cetera? Well, uh, this is Alex from Volpe. Uh, maybe I'll take first stab at that. Um, in terms of sources, uh, the the numbers are from our manufacturer research, so it's from industry uh, outreach as well as uh, published literature review of uh, manufacturer specifications. Um, those are actually uh, somewhat easier to find, I would say, for the uh, the European and Asian markets, since the vehicles seem to be more standardized and mass produced on common chassis as opposed to custom manufactured by 150 or 200 different uh, smaller fabricators in the United States. Um, so it's actually um, a, a bit easier to find those there. Uh, happy to share uh, those with anyone interested um, post, post webinar. The, um, um, the slides will, will be available, I believe, as part of the recorded webinar. So um, 
And if anyone has uh, interest in finding the original uh, resources for these, um, and there's of course more under the under the cover that we we didn't uh, choose to show here, I'm happy to discuss with anyone. And uh, this is Chief Myers from Portland. So uh, with regards to the Harvard study, uh, we our intent is to put multiple white papers out uh, regarding the proof that vibrant cities don't burn the direct correlation between other public health threats that cities see uh, and the same formulas that we use to predict fire are being used to predict other things. Um, it, for, for, and, and I think it'll largely go through the public health publications. This really is a public health issue. Um, with that, my interest as a fire chief is to steer the fire industry into the public health framework, uh, health and all policy approach, more public health oriented, I look at fire as a public health issue, primarily because it is public health is, uh, uh, indices, livability indices that are driving fire. So uh, this is a larger scale project for the fire industry, I think. Um, you know, we are out there. Uh, this is a little bit, um, you know, this is not your normal traditional uh, way a fire service would look at this and take this approach. Uh, the way we're doing our business, there is only uh, one other area in the world we think are attacking it this way it is in the greater Manchester area of, of England. Um, so it'll be a, a little bit new for us in the fire service. This type of predictive modeling is not new for public health. And uh, so that's where we think we'll gain the most ground. We'll, we'll push that avenue. We are also uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, trying to educate city leadership teams. Um, uh, for our success as, as a fire service, I, I think depends on uh, the ability to link arms with other uh, public um, departments. Just like we solved the fire problem in the 1800s, the public health problem will be solved by bringing, bringing all of the different bureaus and departments together, uh, linked arm in arm, and, and focusing on livability and vibrancy issues. Great, thank you. Um, a question for Alex and, and the Volpe folks. Um, in your research, have you done looking into relative costs of the equipment that you're talking about, um, either in terms of uh, U.S. cities purchasing the, the, the vehicles that are currently available in Europe or uh, in terms of manufacture in the United States? Sure. Um, <clears throat> we have looked um, somewhat at costs as well. Um, in general, for, so I'll start with non-emergency. Um, on the box truck, for example, uh, side, uh, cab overs are becoming more uh, more commonly available. There can still be a bit of a, a, a premium in price uh, of a few percent. For example, um, I can, I'm thinking of a Mac chassis, Mac cab over versus a, a Mac conventional cab. Uh, you might you might be paying an extra four or five percent. Um, that may not be across the board. Um, I understand that at least New York and Chicago have experimented with Madras uh, apparatus in the past, uh, but that may have been uh, some decades ago. Uh, it would be an interesting area to look into the extent to which there would be barriers to uh, trialing uh, uh, overseas equipment uh, and uh, perhaps uh, documenting the performance and, and figuring out how, how it could work. Um, the, like I said, it, it does appear to be more mass produced and more, more standardized equipment. Um, so it may be uh, a matter of, of, of figuring out some of the softer barriers to how one would procure them. Um, so um, it, on non-emergency costs are going, going to be comparable, possibly slightly higher on the cab over for the, uh, the European uh, apparatus equipment. We don't have uh, cost information right now. This is Jonah. I would add that in any sort of cost benefit analysis, it's helpful to step um, outside of the immediate cost of the vehicle and consider external costs that aren't necessarily factored um, in. So you know the cost of, of collisions or street maintenance um, as a result of larger vehicles, you know, may be more than made up for by the cost of slightly more expensive vehicles. And, you know, that's a very complex cost-benefit analysis, but something that might yield um, interesting talking points for having that conversation uh, among city departments and manufacturers. Another cost-benefit uh, analysis component I would just uh, 
mention is is the number of people required to operate each truck. Um, a, a tiller truck requires uh, typically a four-person crew uh, to to operate, uh, whereas um, a, a two-axle ladder truck um, like the the Madras M32 uh, could potentially be operated with only two people, uh, certainly three. Uh, so there is also that uh, continuing cost of just how many people does it take to operate a truck, which over Great, the life time can outweigh that difference. Got it. Um, so we have time for one last question, um, and this one is uh, heading over to Chief Myers and the folks in Portland. Um, you're talking about some pretty big worldview shifting stuff. Um, and so we're curious, and what we're hearing from folks on the phone is that they're curious about what are the um, sort of management or operational changes that you see as necessary to really get at this question of how do you rethink practices and rethink equipment in order to, to get to your goal of zero? Zero fatalities. Uh, so it's uh, Mike Myers from Portland. So there are a couple of levels to that. One is, in general, uh, acceptance within the city of Portland, because uh, this is uh, obviously a completely different approach on how we would um, do fire prevention or how we might staff in the future or how our bureau gets funded. Um, from that, from the way we've been presenting it to the council, the mayor, uh, city administrator is really, you know, uh, looking at the uh, initiatives and the priorities of the mayor, which are typically going to be universal across most urban cities uh, across the country, and then embracing the fact that uh, it's unsustainable, our budget is unsustainable. In, it, as, as Portland grows, and we're looking at a huge population increase over the next few years. And with that population increase, we know call volume, if we do nothing at all, if all I do is sit in my office and make sure I put, you know, wheels on the fire trucks and put fuel in the truck, do nothing else, uh, uh, I do nothing else, the call volume will exponentially increase in line with the population. That means my only, if I operate the same way I've been operating in the past, if I operate that way in the future, that means my method of, of answering that is I need more fire trucks, more firefighters, more fire stations. That answer is economically un, unstable, un, un, unsustainable. We, we, we won't be able to fund it. We simply won't. And so, um, so it won't get funded. And that means that the population will increase, the call volume will go up, and the fire service will stay with what they have today, and they'll try to manage that, that call volume, and that is unsustainable. This is the, 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 uh, the only way that I'm going to make a, a stable fire bureau that can stabilize its budget over the long term, and that can truly get to the root of the problem is if we can convert the way we think. And from a management standpoint in the city leadership team, we all tend to agree with that. Um, and that's just my bureau. I'm not talking about the police bureau. I'm not talking about other bureaus that have public safety responsibilities as well. That's just the fire bureau and, and our approach here. From internal, um, it's taken a lot of convincing. But the, the key to it for me here is we have 31 uh, fire stations, so 31 neighborhoods, if you would uh, accept that. Each neighborhood is different and unique in Portland. I have some urban wildland forested areas that have an urban wildland fire problem and different public health problems up there. And I have stations that are inner city that um, it's all, you know, uh, residential and commercial and it's drug addiction, mental health and uh, um, uh, homelessness are the problems. If I can, and I have captains, officers in every one of these locations. So we just invest in them. Um, we give them all this data. We're teaching company officers about how to how to handle this and how to uh, build these blueprints for success. I'm growing good managers, and so far there's been uh, a pretty good acceptance of where we're headed. They're excited about helping us uh, find a solution. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, a virtual huge round of applause to, to Chief Myers and the folks in the room with him in Portland, and also to Alex Epstein and Jonah Kiranza from the Volpe Center. Um, thank you guys very much. This has been a really great webinar. Um, so quickly, we're going to wrap up here, but there are a couple of upcoming events at NACTA that I just want to flag for you all. A, uh, Roadshow in Columbus, Ohio, if you're in the Columbus, Ohio region, talking about bike lane design, and the NACTA Designing Cities Conference in Los Angeles in October. 
Um, there's more information about both of those on the NACDO website, which is www.nacdo.org. And also check back there because we'll have an ongoing uh, host of new webinars coming up. So thank you to Chief Myers, to Alex and Jonah, and thank you everybody on this call for joining us.